Good day, Grade 12. Welcome to this next lesson in physical science. If you haven't been here before, I'd like to welcome you. Um, and I'd like to encourage you, even if you have been with me before, to join the Grade 12 science class. Um, the reason I would like you to do that is a couple, twofold, threefold, I think. Um, but I'm going to quickly show you how you would do it. OK, so the first thing we're going to do is go to your interweb browser. It doesn't matter what you use, Google, Chrome, Firefox, whatever. Please don't tell me using Internet Explorer. Okay, <laughs> and then you're gonna click into toenable.org. And I just realized I'm still logged in. So I'm gonna log out to show you what the screen's gonna look like. Um, there we go, let me just log out. There you go. So this is what your, your website will look like. It's got um, and that, this is the landing page for to enable and there will be a bit here. This is if you've already registered with us. Um, if you haven't, then you need to register. It's quick and easy. I obviously have already registered, so I'm just going to log in. Right now, you will create a dashboard and your dashboard won't look exactly like mine because of the fact that I've got administration and I'm a mentor, so I've got all these classrooms and everything, but you guys will definitely have this block here on the left hand side. It says curriculum, learner and teacher resources. And what you guys need to do is go choose a subject. So you're gonna go press the red button, ting, okay. And you'll come across a huge list of all different subjects, okay? Now, you don't have to only sign up for maths or science or whatever. Admittedly, at the moment, there are only maths and science online lessons, but Turnable's got platform, on the platform, obviously you can see here, all the different subjects and they've got material on all these subjects. Okay, but we're talking about grade 12 science now. So, we find physical science, click, and then you choose grade 12, okay? Now, again, the grade 12s, just because you're in grade 12 doesn't mean you can't go and register for grade 10s and 11s. Registering for it means nothing really. I mean, it's not like you're signing in and you have to do stuff, okay? What it does is just give you access to the content for that grade. And if you've missed something in grade 11, that you need to be reminded of. Let's say, for example, in grade 10, they teach you about the mole and then they skip over the mole in grade 11 and suddenly in grade 12, you're talking stoichiometry again and you're like, what was the mole again? You can go and look it up in the grade 10 content. There's nothing stopping you from doing that. So you don't have to stick to your grade 12 stuff, okay? So anyway, so you, get to the, you click the grade you want, which at the moment is grade 12, and you click enroll. Ta-da! You are now registered for the physical science grade 12. Awesome. So what's going to happen is on your dashboard, there will now be a little blue box. And depending on how many subjects you've registered for, you will have that many little blue blocks. And if you click on your little blue block, it will show you all the weeks with all the material that is available to you. Okay, all of it. And in every one of these weeks, if you click it, let's click, uh, I don't know, let's click momentum, week two. Okay, you will see that it will give you in it. Within that week will be all these different lessons and you'll see there's an MP4, which is a video, there's PowerPoints, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they basically tell you about everything that you need to know. And this, this front page here, tells you exactly what is in this week's work. Okay, so you can go through that and go, oh yes, I definitely want to know how to draw vector diagrams. I must go look at lesson one. So there's my week two lesson one. That's what I must go look at. Okay, and there's questionnaires, there's exam papers, etc, etc. So that's already there. Okay, but that's beside the point. What we're talking about now is why I want you to join this class. I mean, other than getting all this information and it's to do with these things on the left hand side. On the left hand side, you'll see there's the dashboard, which obviously is going to take you back to where we started. And then there's the upcoming events and live assessments and messaging. Don't worry about revision right now. So upcoming events, if you click on it, you're going to see the lessons. OK, and that's where we gain that you where you will access all these lessons. And the nice thing about this is we're for, you'll get this upcoming events for however many classes you've registered for. So if you registered only for grade 12 science, you will only see the upcoming classes for grade 12 science, right? And then we'll click on the view events and I'll show you what happens. But quickly, the other things I want to do, and I mentioned this yesterday, but I want to make sure you understand 
is that ideally what would happen in this type of lesson environment is that I would teach a section. So let's say I teach organic chemistry, or I might just teach the reactions or rates of reaction or chemical equilibrium, whatever. And then I would set a multiple choice questionnaire on the internet and it's called a live assessment because you do it live on the internet you click the answers in it's not it's anonymous i don't know who you are i don't know who got what right anything all i know is that say for example 60 people answered the assessment and i will give like two or three days for the people to do it okay then i can see oh 10 percent of them only 10 percent could answer question four and then i can go look at question four and i can see oh look it's to do with um, catalysts and how they affect rates of reaction and chemical equilibria, for example. And then I can say, okay, fine, let me do a lesson specifically aimed at that to make sure that you guys understand it all. So it's supposed to be a feedback loop, okay, so that I basically find out what you guys are struggling on and then I teach that. Okay, so that's the live assessment. Now let's talk about actually going to see it. So you view the event by clicking the view event and you open live TV link. And then you wait okay right and you have to click the green button the join the event button and there'll be a bit of a time lapse and i think no i haven't okay and you will actually hear a horrible sound coming now but it's actually just showing you that you are actually getting basically find out what you guys are struggling on and then i teach that so that is the video you're actually going to be watching it okay but what's also very important is this message studio button, the green button over here. And what I want to do is I want you guys to be able to message me. And like, for example, I've had some questions where people have said, oh, we're really struggling with certain sections. Please, can you go through those sections? And that's what I'm doing. I'm doing those sections specifically for people who have requested them, okay? So if somebody comes along today and says, I'm really, really struggling with chemical equilibria, let's just use that again, or redox. I'm really studying, struggling with oxidation reduction. Then I'll say, okay, fine. As soon as I finish organic chemistry, because that was a request as well, then I will move on to redox and so on and so on and so on. Or if you guys have got specific exam question problems that you want to go through, then you can message me as well. Okay, so that's basically the idea behind this whole session. Okay, so enough about that. Let's get on to the proper stuff. Let's talk more about organic chemistry. So yesterday we were talking about the different types of intermolecular forces and we spoke about intra and intermolecular forces and remember the intra were within the molecule and we're talking covalent and ionic. Okay, where the intermolecular forces were basically your van der Waals forces and within the van der Waals forces, there were the London forces. And then the other intermolecular forces were hydrogen bonding. And that's kind of where we are at the moment. Now, what I also said to you yesterday was that in the old exam papers, whenever they asked you to classify the type of bonding that you would have in organic compounds, you'd either have van der Waals forces or hydrogen bonding. That's basically it, okay? And you'd explain according to those. Nowadays, they don't use van der Waals forces. They use London forces. They are more specific. They use London forces. So if you say van der Waals forces, you're not going to get it right. But that does mean that if you go back to some of the older exam papers and you do them for revision, and then you go look at their memos and you'll see the words van der Waals forces and you'll think you're wrong. You're not. It's just that they've changed it, okay? So where you see the words van der Waals forces in the memo, they mean London forces now, okay? They've just been more specific now. Okay, so remember we spoke about this yesterday and I didn't finish it, which is why I'm carrying on. Induced dipole forces. And I explained about the fact that what happens with an induced dipole force is you've got a nonpolar molecule, okay? In a nonpolar molecule, the electric charge is evenly distributed, but at one particular time, the electrons might not be evenly distributed. So let's say, for example, we've just got, let's pretend that this is a molecule, okay? There are two new, new neutrons, okay? It's two atoms that have joined, joined to form one big molecule. So electrons are going around it, okay? So let's pretend 
let's pretend, and this is what I, where I was at, I think, yesterday, is that this electron's coming around. And remember, it's three-dimensional, so it's going round and round. And at a specific point in time, I take a snapshot of it, if I could, and I see this electron over here. And at exactly the same time, some other random electron in a different orbital is spinning around, okay? And at exactly the same time, it also happens to be on this side of the atom. I mean, it's a momentary, it's a momentary force. It's a momentary dipole. It happens like for a split, split second, okay? So then, do you agree that if I came along and let's say that I was suddenly, no, let's not use that color. I was suddenly the size of an atom and this is my eye. There are my eyelashes, okay? And I had to look at, at this atom. Do you see, or molecule, do you see that I would see that this side was slightly negative and this side was slightly positive? Because as far as I was concerned, the electrons were on this side and yet was an absence of electrons, and which makes it slightly positive. Okay, so now let's pretend that there was another neutral molecule, non-polar molecule, and it happens to be over here. Okay, and let's just have pretend that just for an instant, its valence electron, let's say it's only got one for a change, is on this side at exactly the same time that this one's valence electrons are on this side. Then do you agree that this side will be slightly, okay, no, yeah, positive as well, and this side will be slightly negative. So what's going to happen? Since both of these are slightly positive, they're going to repel. But what would happen if, for instance, that wasn't the case? What would happen if this electron was actually on the other side? What would happen if this electron was on this side at exactly the same time that this one's electrons were on this side? Well, do you agree that then this will be slightly negative, this side, and this side will be slightly positive and then you'd have attraction happening but what you need to understand is it's very very brief attraction and all it does is allow these molecules to just come slightly closer together than they would normally before the electrons move back into place and repulsion and normal thing carries on like usual okay so that's what happens molecule is very temporarily a dipole which means the molecules next to each other are attracted to each other very 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 weakly right the other type of dipole we can have is a dipole induced dipole okay the previous one was induced dipoles. That's when we had two non-polar molecules that came next to each other and managed to cause each other to be dipoles. This one is when we have a dipole induced dipole. In other words, we have a dude, the blue dude, and he's already a dipole. He's already a dipole. He's a polar molecule. He's slightly positive on this side and slightly negative on this side, okay? As he comes near a neutral molecule or atom, because he's slightly positive over here, what happens? He attracts the electrons to this side. And because he attracts electrons to this side, what happens? It's not that the positives move, because remember, protons cannot move. So it's not that they move. It's just that because all the electrons on this side, there's a lack of electrons on this side. So therefore, this side becomes slightly positive and this side becomes slightly negative. But remember that this is very, 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 very temporary and it's a very, very weak force. Okay, And again, it just allows the mo molecules to move Close to closer to each other just for a very brief second before they carry on. Right now, let's talk viscosity. Now, what is viscosity? Viscosity is a measure of how easily a liquid flows, or better still, it's a measure of how much a liquid resists flowing. The higher the viscosity, the more viscous a substance is. 
Okay, so I got, okay, so the stronger the intermolecular forces, the greater the viscosity of the substance, which makes sense because if you've got strong intermolecular forces, it means that the atoms and molecules are held close together, which means it's not going to flow very easily, okay? So there's this little video that I got. I just want to first erase all the writing. There we go. And I just want to, sh it just shows you the difference between viscosities of two liquids. Okay, so here we go. So you can see that if both liquids are clear, the one on the left-hand side is obviously not less viscous. Look how easily it pours. Okay, so that's obviously like water or something. Whereas this is possibly clear gelatin or something where um, it is highly viscous, highly. It is sticky like glue or maple syrup or honey. Okay, so this is something that is very viscous. So the only reason they chose them to both be clear was to show you that the color doesn't actually give you an indication of how viscous something is. Okay, so now let's talk density. Density is a measure of the mass per unit volume. Okay, mass per unit volume. So therefore the units are kilograms, meter, kilograms per decimeter cubed. Let's think about this. Density equals mass over volume. Mass is measured in kilograms and volume is measured in decimeters cubed. If you didn't know that before, now you do. Volume, as far as you guys are concerned, is in decimeters cubed, not centimeters cubed, not cubic meters, not liters. I want cent decimeters cubed, okay? For grade 12 physical science, it's decimeters cubed. The solid phase is usually the most dense phase, excluding water. Water is a bit different because, because the water, that's why ice floats, because the water forms a crystalline trap of lattice and it spreads out its molecules and because the hydrogen bond in between it, um, it actually is less dense. But most solid phases are the most dense of the phases. Okay, if you think of... Um, anything else really other than water and it's something that is going to sink faster and this is due to the strong intermolecular forces found in solids so density can be used to separate different liquids so just some examples how they would use it in organic chemistry in america they have I don't know if you know, but yeah, we tend to transport our fuel using big trucks, okay? Whereas in certain countries and in certain states, especially in America, they have these underground fuel lines. So what they'll have is they'll have a fuel depot, right? And then over here on this side, they'll have the station, right? And this is where you go and get your petrol, right? As you know, like Shell, BP, whatever. Okay, but underneath there, there will be a fuel line. This was the soil. There's a fuel line. But obviously now this thing needs to get petrol. It needs to get diesel. I mean, if it was like in South Africa, you'd have to have petrol 95, unleaded, lead replacement fuel, etc., etc. Okay. Now, how they're not going to put down six or seven or eight different lines just so that they can feed all this fuel from the fuel depot to the station and the different types so what they do which is very clever oh i think it's very clever is that they will say for example send through some diesel okay let's say they're sending through some diesel and when when they finished sending through the diesel what they do is they separate it with water so they will at the end of the diesel they'll pump through a couple of or well, a large amount of water and then maybe after that if they still have to send some stuff they will send some petrol through now the reason is it's going to form something like this it's going to form layers okay but it's Obviously, what will happen is that the water is the least dense. So water is going to float on the top and it can evaporate out. So that's not a problem. So as soon as the people see that there's water coming out instead of the diesel, they can switch off and then they can change to the different tank because obviously there's a diesel tank and a petrol tank, etc. At this different pe at this petrol station, and then they can either bleed off the water or they can. It's fine. It can stay at the top because it can just evaporate off. Okay, right. So that's how they use different densities 
identities. So let's go back to this picture. This picture is really just showing you the different identities of obvious stuff that you guys are used to. So you've got honey, which is the most dense, and then corn syrup. I don't know if you guys know much about corn syrup. It's just that that's, it's also called maple syrup, I think, maple syrup. Okay, then you've got dish soap, and then you've got water, and they've made it red with food coloring, and then you've got your vegetable oil. So this would be like, for example, your olive oil. Okay, so right, so you can just, all I'm showing you this for is to show you that you can actually use the fact that they've got different um, densities to separate your different fluids, very much like they did over here. And this is also a lava lamp as well. There are different types of lava lamps, but one of the ways that they can use do lava lamps is to do this, where they've got waxy stuff and lit water, and then they just have a light bulb at the bottom that heats up the wax, and then it heats up the different layers and causes energy uh, to flow around it, which then makes the colors change and go through it. But that's neither here nor there. Okay, so this is the main usage of the different densities when it comes to the fuels. Now let's talk melting points and boiling points. Melting points and boiling points. Okay, so first of all, you need to know that the intermolecular forces affect the boiling points and melting points of substances. Substances with weak intermolecular forces have low melting and boiling points, okay? Which makes sense because if they have got weak intermolecular forces, it's easy to break them up, okay? Just a reminder, a melting point is a temperature at which a substance changes, substance changes, changes from a solid to a liquid or vice versa, okay? Whereas a boiling point is a point at which there is a phase change from liquid to gas or vice versa. Okay, so melting point is the temperature at which you get from solid to liquid or liquid to gas, uh, solid. And the boiling point is when you're going from liquid to gas or gas to liquid. Okay, so as we were saying, substances with weak intermolecular forces are going to have lower melting and boiling points. And the reason for that is that there's less energy required to overcome the forces, which makes sense. Okay, so obviously then the corollary to that is that strong intermolecular forces result in high melting points and boiling points. But this is important and it's very important people get to confuse. When the temperature is increased, the forces don't weaken. Okay, it's not that the forces weaken, it's just that the molecules have enough energy to overcome the forces. A lot of people go, oh, if you increase the temperature, it makes the intermolecular forces weaker and therefore they've got, they'll, um, break these bonds, okay? That's not how it works. By increasing the temperature, you increase the energy of the molecules, which are vibrating on the spot to start with, okay? So now that they've got more energy, they have enough energy to overcome the forces of attraction between the molecules and therefore break free to become either liquid or gas or whatever, okay? So now let's talk about alkanes and melting and boiling points. Okay, we'll just talk about boiling points in a minute. It doesn't matter whether we look at melting points or boiling points, the trend is still the same. So alkanes only have weak London forces or it's called induced dipole forces. So if we look at this, we've got ethane, which is what? It is, if I draw the conden condensed structural formula, it's CH3CH3 right, which can be written as C2H6, two carbon, six hydrogens. And you see that the boiling point is minus 89 degrees Celsius. This is in degrees Celsius, by the way. So therefore, do you agree this is a gas at room temperature? If the boiling point is at minus 89 degrees Celsius, it is a gas at minus 88 degrees Celsius and everything above, okay? Propane is made up of three carbons. So it is going to be C3H8, 2N plus 2, or I could draw it as CH3CH2CH3. And you'll notice that there's quite a big jump, and now the boiling point is at minus 42. 
still it gets at room temperature. Do you agree? Room temperature is about 25 degrees Celsius, by the way. Butane, butane is 4, so it's going to be CH3, CH2, CH2, CH3, or I could write it as C4H10. And do you see that its boiling point is minus 0.5? So it is also a gas at room temperature. Whereas pentane is a has a boiling point of 36 degrees. So therefore, we can say that that is obviously a liquid at room temperature. Because room temperature, like I said, is about 25 degrees Celsius. So um, what's considered to be 25 degrees Celsius. Therefore, this is obviously a liquid, and similarly, hexane is obviously a liquid. Now, let's just go through the formula. The formula, this is pentane, so it's five of them. So, it's going to be CH3, CH2, 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 CH3, or it's C5H12, and this is going to be C6H14. I'm sorry, I'm not drawing out that whole lot. Okay. So do you notice this, that the longer the main chain, the stronger the intermolecular forces, the higher the boiling point. Okay, the longer the main chain, the longer the main chain, the stronger the intermolecular forces, the higher the boiling point. So it's actually not got to necessarily do with the number of carbons, but how long the main chain is, okay? So the longer the main chain, the stronger the intermolecular forces, the higher the boiling point. Now let's talk about alkenes. So first off, before we even talk about anything else, I want you to look at the boiling points of alkanes, alkenes. Ethene's boiling point is minus 102, whereas ethane is minus 89. Propene is minus 48, whereas propane is minus 42. And for example, hexane is 64, whereas hex hexane is 69, whereas hexene is 64. So do you see that the boiling points are a lot lower for, yeah, the boiling, sorry, I should check in my numbers and see if they're right. The boiling points are not lower for your alkenes. And remember we said the reason for that was because the alkenes are more reactive. Okay, the alkenes are more reactive. So alkenes have got much, also very weak London forces. So basically all your hydrocarbons, all your hydrocarbons, are going to have weak London forces between their molecules, okay? So let's just talk about, again, the formula. So this is going to be CH2CH2. Why is that? Because it's C double bonded with C and then just two hydrogens. Okay, so do you agree that C2H4? Propene would be C dash C double bonded C, one, two, three, four, five, six. So it's going to be C3H6. Butene is going to be one, two, three double bonded four, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So it's C4H8. Pentene, well, I'm hoping you realize that you can see what the formula is. It's CNH2N, which we actually already discussed already. So this is already discussed already, my apologies. So it's C5H10, and this is going to be C6H12. So do you see again, the longer the main chain, the stronger the intermolecular forces, the higher the boiling point. The longer the main chain, the stronger the intermolecular forces, the higher the boiling point. Also notice that these three here are going to be gas at room temperature, and these are going to be liquid at room temperature. Okay, liquid. And finally, notice that the boiling points of the alkenes are all lower than the alkanes, which means, as we knew already, that the alkenes are more reactive than the alkanes. Okay, now let's talk about flammability and vapor pressure. Flammability and vapor pressure. So, flammability is a measure of how easy it be for a substance to catch a light and burn. Okay, so please understand we're not talking about 
something, the ability, how much energy it gives off to when it burns, etc. We're saying how easy it is it for that substance to actually ignite, okay? So that depends on the flash point of a substance. Now the flash point of a substance is defined as the lowest temperature that is likely to form um, that is of a substance is the lowest temperature that the substance is likely to form a gas mixture which you can set a light. Okay, let's try again. The flash point of a substance is the lowest temperature of a substance where it is likely to form a gas mixture which could be set alight. So mainly we talk about flash points with respect to gases. Okay, however, if you have a liquid which has got a very low flash point, then we call it flammable. Okay. So a liquid is only called flammable if it has a low enough flash point. So that means we're talking about our petrols and our fuels, etc. A substance that is classified as non-flammable can still be forced to burn, but it won't ignite easily. Okay, so in other words, you'll have to struggle to get it to burn. So when a substance, and this is important, and you need to understand this very carefully, is that, or very clearly, is that when a substance is in the liquid or solid phase, there are still some molecules in the gas state, okay? And you need to understand that. So when you have, for example, if you think about a cool drink, let's say, for example, you have got a bot thing of water, yeah. Okay, here is a bottle of water, a glass of water, and you'll have some ice blocks in it, Okay, now I'm hoping you realize that even though there are ice blocks in this, this actual container has got three phases in it. There's the water vapor above the surface, there's the ice blocks that are on the surface, if not going towards on the surface, and then there is the liquid within the water. I mean within the fluid stage. So this is three phases. There's the liquid, which is the water, the solid, which is the ice, and then there is the water vapor above it. So even if we can't see the water vapor, it is there all the time. Okay. So when a substance is in a liquid or solid state, there are still some molecules in the gas state. Okay. And these molecules are in the gas state because they've had enough energy to overcome the intermolecular forces. And that's another thing I need to explain to you. There's a big difference between evaporation and boiling. Okay, and you guys need to know this. Let's say we've got a pot, okay, and we fill it with water. Now, if we fill it with water and we just leave it for the day, okay, and if it's a fairly warm day and it's in an an enclosed space like outside or whatever with a bit of a breeze. What you might have found, what you generally will find is that you'll end up with a lower layer, a lower level of water. And we'll go, oh, the water has evaporated out. And yes, it has. Some of this water will have evaporated out. It will have evaporated. But what has actually happened is that these particles in the water have been bouncing against the surface of the water and against the surface of the glass and the surface of everything and then they've been bouncing against each other and eventually probably due to the fact that it's sitting in the sun and they're getting a little bit warm they will have enough energy to break free of the cohesive force of tension, okay, forces between the molecules or atoms on the surface, and they will break free and they will free, become gas molecules. Now, what actually happens is that 90% of the time, these gas molecules don't have, where's my mouse gone? There it is, don't have enough energy to go very far away. So what actually happens is that the gas molecules, the water vapor molecules, sit just above the surface. And they'll continue to sit just above the surface in the water vapor phase unless something happens. For example, they cool down, lose some energy, in which case they will evaporate down. I mean, they'll condense and then they will come down into the surface or they will fly away because they've had enough energy. So just above here would be water particles, okay? Now that's evaporation. Boiling, on the other hand, what happens is that we, 
add heat. We add heat. And by adding heat, we basically excite the molecules so that we give them extra kinetic energy. We excite them so they have enough energy to break free of the bond. And that is why there is boiling and there is losing of the particles at a much more rapid rate. And you can usually see that in the form of steam. Okay, so that is the difference between boiling and evaporation. Right, so now let's talk about these sub these molecules that are above the surface. These molecules have enough energy to overcome the intermolecular force. We're not talking about boiling here. We're talking about the fact that in a natural state, if you have a glass of water in your room up just above the glass of water, there will be invisible to your eye a layer of gas molecules. But these gas molecules exert a pressure on the liquid and solid and the container. So again, if you want to think about it, here is my container, right? And let's say that here is my solid or liquids. Here's the end of my water. Okay, let's just talk about water. So then what you have, like I've just said, is that there's a layer of molecules just above the surface. But what's special about these molecules is that they actually exert pressure because even though they seem to just be sitting there, what in fact happens is that they have Brownian motion, they've got kinetic energy, and they end up hitting the surface of the liquid or solid and the container. And every time a molecule hits the surface, it exerts a pressure. Okay, moving on. And this pressure is called the vapor pressure of the compound, the vapor pressure of the compound. So it makes sense that if this liquid, this water, liquid or water or whatever it is, has got weak intermolecular forces, then there's going to be lots of particles that have evaporated out. And then there's going to be a high vapor pressure, right? Whereas if the liquid has very low intermolecular forces, weak intermolecular forces, no, sorry, if they've got very strong intermolecular forces, if they've got very strong intermolecular forces, then there's not much energy left for the, well, the particles won't be able to get enough energy to break free, so therefore the vapor pressure is going to be weak. So therefore the vapor pressure, I don't know where to write this down a minute, let me just get a pen. The vapor pressure is inversely proportional, is inversely proportional to the strength of the intermolecular forces. Okay, so the vapor pressure is proportional to one over the IM, the intermolecular strength. Okay, everybody happy with that? The compounds with higher vapor pressures will also have lower flash points, and that makes sense because that means that there's more gas that's available above the surface. Okay, so if you've got a high vapor pressure, it means that you've got a low flash point, and and that's also because it means you've got low energy is required to break it up into the gas and they are very, very, very flammable. Right, so let's look at these, this table. This is a table of your alkanes. It shows your intermolecular forces, your vapor pressure, your flash point and your flammability. So the pressure exerted at a specific temperature on a solid or liquid compound bound molecules are that are in the gas phase. This is what we're talking about with vapor pressure. The definition of vapor pressure is the pressure exerted at a specific temperature on a liquid or solid compound by molecules that are in the gas phase. So please understand that just because I've got water in my cup doesn't mean that the vapor pressure gas is necessarily water vapor. It could be something else that's pushing down on it. Okay, so if we look at this table, you can see we've got, again, ethane, propane, butane, and pentane. And I'm going to remind you that ethane is made up of two carbons, propane is made up of three, butane is four, and pentane is five. And by their naming, we can actually tell that these are all long straight chains. So there's no branching happening here. The main intermolecular forces are going to be London forces since these are all alkanes, right? Now let's look at the vapor pressure. Do you see the vapor pressure goes from 3,750, 3, which is quite high, 
down to 57,9. So do you see that as the length of the chain gets longer, so the vapor pressure gets smaller, which means that the force between the molecules is getting lower, okay? The flash point is also getting smaller, but not actually the flash point is getting higher because minus 135 degrees Celsius is actually lower than minus 39. So the flash point is getting higher, which makes sense because there's a lower vapor point, vapor pressure. But you'll notice that all of these still are very high. The flammability is very high. And that makes sense because if you look at it, this flash point here is at minus 49 degrees Celsius, which is super low. Okay, minus 49. Sure, that's really cold. Okay, right, grade 12s. I'm going to call it a day. We're going to carry on with the vapor pressure with ethanol, propanol, and butanol tomorrow. And uh, not tomorrow, on Monday. And we'll carry on with the rest of organic chemistry. Have a great weekend.